get predestination, some of these other things. And he said, well, you know, most of us good Baptists, we just kind of skip over that. And, uh, you know, we've done that for quite a while, and I agree with Mark on that. A lot of our guys, when they come to a difficult passage of Scripture, one that doesn't uh, jive with their theological viewpoint or one that doesn't seem to come together, they will simply uh, skip over that and, and move on to something else. But I, I believe this with all my heart. I believe that's one of the reasons that we're anemic in our doctrine today is because we haven't really tackled some of the harder issues. We, we see something that doesn't come easily to us and, and we kind of jump over it. And so really tonight, uh, and looking at this, and I called a preacher friend of mine. I said, I'm thinking about going this direction with this, trying to explain it. And he said, you know, I, I preached through the book of Ephesians a few years ago. And he said, when I got to that passage of Scripture, it took me three weeks to get up the courage to preach it. And he said, and I called 20 different pastors to see how they did it. So it only took me two weeks and only called one pastor. Amen. But uh, I want you to read with me. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 as we kind of refresh from last Sunday evening. And then we'll look at verses 3 and 4. And the truth is that uh, if you hold a doctrinal position, you ought to be able to explain that doctrinal position. And so we do not believe that God has limited his atonement and that some are predestined to hell. But we do believe that God knows and in his foreknowledge, he understands and he knows who will be saved, who will come to faith. And so really there's not a conflict if you rightly divide the word of truth. And so we'll do that with the Lord's help this evening. And by the way, let me just make this statement. Uh, if you disagree with me tonight, uh, you say, well, preacher, I hold to more of a, a, a Calvinistic or a hyper-Calvinistic type uh, position, or perhaps, perhaps you're here and you would hold to a more Armenian position. That would be a losing your salvation position. Uh, you know, we can love each other and disagree, but this is the position that we take, and that we're comfortable with that, so we can disagree disagreeably and it's good fun it's good study but uh, this is the position that we're not Armenian because God gives us eternal salvation amen and when a person gets saved he's saved he's a new creature in Christ and the, that's the position we'll see tonight but also we don't believe in the hyper Calvinism that says that God has already elected some uh, to hell. We believe that whosoever will may come. And so we're more of a Biblicist than a Calvinist or an Armenian. And you say, well, preacher, you got to be one or the other. No, you don't. No, you don't. You have to believe the Bible to be the Word of God. And I'll take the Bible's opinion more than any man's philosophy or opinion of the Bible. And by the way, let me just say that in introduction. Uh, take the Bible at its face value. And don't spend so much time reading what others say about the Bible that you neglect to actually read the Bible. And the best commentary on the Bible is what? The Bible. The Bible. Uh, I have literally hundreds of commentaries in my office and by way of the Internet. It's a wonderful age we live in that we can read what so many have written. Many times in a study like this, I'll read so much and I just say, you know what, I want to go back and read the text again and just look at what the Word of God says. And so uh, pray with me tonight and let's ask the Lord to give us a good reading of the Word. Father, uh, help us now to have clarity of thought, to convey the passage before us into a way, not only that we can understand, but Lord, most of all, that could help us. Well, what good is information of Scripture, that application in our daily personal life? And so help us not to simply be pursuers of information, but Lord, let us, by the power of the Holy Spirit, have application of the Word of God that we might be that Christian man, that Christian woman, young man or young lady that you'd have us to be. Thank for Mark and, Lord, his ministry and those that sing with him. Uh, what a blessing tonight. And we thank you. I'll oh, pray for his daddy. I know he's recovering from surgery. And, God, we just lift him up to you. Lord, I pray that you'd have a blessing now on the reading of that Word. In Christ's name, amen. Look at verse number 1. We looked at this last week, but we'll look at it again Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we studied those two verses last week. Let's look at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Verse 4. According as he hath chosen us in him 
before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Now, let's just take verses 3 and 4 together tonight and see what the Word of God says. Verse number 3, very simply, by the way, there will not be notes on the screen tonight. If you want to take notes, follow along with me as best I can. If you missed a note, raise your hand, and I will ignore you completely. Uh, but uh, uh, number 1 tonight, I, I want you to notice very simply as we look at verse number 3, we have been blessed. Can anybody in the room tonight say, God's not blessed me? We are a blessed people. Uh, God has done so much for you and so much for me. The day we got saved was by far the greatest day of our life that will ever be. Because at that moment, we began to understand what it is to be a child of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You and I are blessed. And that's what verse 3 said. We are blessed. Uh, it says, blessed be God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us. Now, our blessings that we bless God, we, we say bless the Lord, bless God the Father. Uh, our blessings are simply a declaration of His blessings, which are the deeds that He's already done. We praise Him because of all that He's already done. We praise Him for who He is. We praise Him for His attributes. We praise Him for His majesty, for His glory, for His omnipotence, for His omniscience, for His omnipresence. We praise Him. We declare back to Him what He has already done for us. We look outside and we see uh, what God has done in creation, what God has done in sustaining us, and, and then we cannot help but declare back to Him a worthy, a glory, honor and praise and that's what they were doing a few moments ago in song and we do it in testimony and voice when we look at all that God has done and we say praise ye the Lord blessings our blessings are a declaration of his deeds we bless him because of his blessings for us it is amazing to me to think where would you and I be without the Lord where would you and I be if somewhere, somehow, maybe you're a first, second, third, fourth, maybe you're a 20th generation Christian, I don't know, but somewhere, someone in your family or you yourself came to a knowledge of Jesus Christ and all of a sudden God showed his blessing to you and that's worthy to be praised. We're blessed. God saved and Listen, I'm, I, I'm not, I wouldn't try to embarrass or hurt you, but boy, you ever been around poor mouth Christians how you doing oh woe is me oh pitiful me there's not a pitiful Christian among us you're blessed blessed now we praise him for what he's done who he is but you know it's a good deal to be saved I mean if you think being saved is a bad deal you misunderstood we got the good deal. He got the bad deal. He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteous of God in him. Now, our praise is to him, but our prize is that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, look what it says. He hath blessed us, uh, blessing be God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Now, what's the last two words of the verse? Why I did a study of that in Christ. When you and I trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, when we were born again, we were born into the family of God. We are in Christ. And in Christ, all of these blessings are now ours. Think, think about this thought. Everything the Father endowed to the Son by our salvation, we now are partakers of. We are joint heirs with Jesus Christ. You say, preacher, what do you have? I have everything Jesus has. I have everything he offers. You say, well, uh, I don't understand that. Well, let me just read some Bible to you. Romans chapter 3 and verse 24. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. You and I are no longer guilty. We're justified. Why? Because we're in Christ. We don't walk around guilty. We don't walk around condemned. We are not a bunch of dead men or dead men walking. We are free men and free women in Christ justification 
By the way, if you don't remember what it was like before you got saved to feel the guilt and the pressure and the weight of your sin, you ought to go back and you ought to remember what God did for you that delivered you from the crushing weight of your own sin. Say, preacher, I've never been under conviction about my sin. Then, dear friend, you've never been saved from your sin. We're justified in Christ. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. I don't know if y'all were like this, but my father traveled very much like Mark does, traveled in evangelism, and uh, he would leave on Saturday and come back on Wednesday. Saturday he would get on a plane and fly out, leave out of Nashville Metropolitan Airport, and by Saturday night I had gotten in trouble. I know that's hard to believe. But my mother would say this, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, somewhere during that week, he would usually fly back in on Thursday, and she'd say, now, when your daddy gets home, he's going to wear you out. Now, I was born before political correctness. I was born before all these laws. When I was raised, you could still beat the devil out of your child. By the way, some of you, you, you need to think about that. You say, oh, Brother Stansel, what if they call uh, the Child Protective Services? Just remember this, they're yours till they get there. Take that off the tape because that will get pulled out. and get, I'll get arrested for that, right? Amen. But, but she'd say, now, boy, when your daddy gets home. Now, listen, watch this. I would forget that I was in trouble. I get to play and get to run around. And then that thought, oh, no, it's Monday, but Thursday's coming. And then I'd, I'd get on, get busy, school and basketball and f- football, whatever. And, uh, oh, man, it's Tuesday, but Thursday's coming. Wednesday, I wouldn't forget. All day long, I'd be thinking, I just got one day left of freedom, grace, and the ability to walk straight. Thursday, I dreaded. I'm on my way to pick up your daddy at the airport. See, here's what the world does. They may forget for a little season because of the pleasure of sin. They may forget because of the business of their life. But every now and then, in the quiet moment, in the conscious moment, where where the deep things run through their mind, they look to their heart, and they look to their life, and they realize there is something, and we know that is a someone who is convicting them that they're lost, they're going to bust hell wide open. They know it, God knows it, and they may try to cover it, but they're condemned already. Hey, dear friend, you know why you don't remember that? Because when you got saved, the punishment and penalty, the condemnation that was pressing your soul, has been forever removed from you that's in Christ number three Romans chapter 8 verse 2 for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death in Christ I'm free now it's amazing I preached a little bit about this this morning we think we're free in sin we're actually enslaved in sin we're only free in Christ In sin, you have a wicked taskmaster that cares nothing for your soul. In Christ, you have the God of heaven who died on the cross for your soul. Your freedom. Shackled. Y'all ever listen to that radio show, Unshackled? Pacific Garden Mission. Mission. Boy, what a wonderful picture there. Sin that everybody thinks is freedom is really shackled. But in Christ, we're unshackled and we're free to serve and to love the Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2. Under the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ. In Christ, I'm sanctified. I'm set apart. Hey, I've got a reason to live. I've got a purpose. God has a plan. God has some thoughts for me. He's got an imagination for me. He's going to give me an expected end. In Christ, I have purpose and reason for living. I'm just not sitting here taking up space on this ball of dirt until I die. What does a lost man have to look forward to? Death, the grave, and hell. 
A saved man gets up every morning and says, Today is the day that I can glorify and live for and serve my Lord Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30. But of him are ye in Christ, who God is made unto wisdom, righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Hey, when you got saved, the prize that you got was the wisdom of God. It was the sanctification of Christ. It was the righteousness in Christ. It was redemption from our sin. Friend, let me just tell you this. If you ever forget it, and when you get down and discouraged, and you get a little tired, let me, let me just help you. When you got saved, you got a good thing. It's a good deal to be a child of God in Christ. He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And, and, and by the way, my notes, if you go to my desk right now, there's a pile of notes, and I kept rewriting and rewriting because I was going to talk about all that he's given us. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit. He's given us the church. He's given us a command. He's given us a commission. I mean, we've got a pretty good deal when we serve the Lord in Christ. Number three, notice not only our praise and our prize, but I see our, our place or our position, our place or our position. He says, we are in heavenly places in Christ. Preacher, are you going to gonna go to heaven when you die? Now, I understand what you're trying to say, but I hope you understand my answer, friend, I'm already there. You say, well, you're here. Yeah, but I'm there too. Why? Because I'm in Christ, and Christ is there. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He, he is, he is uh, take, he taking his rightful place. And you say, preacher, uh, you won't know that you get there until you get there. No, I'm going there because I've been promised by God that where he is uh, I'll be there also and listen I can trust the promise of God more than I can trust my five senses you ever seen somebody and you thought hey that looks like so and so oh I'm sorry I do that all the time uh, I was uh, I'll be driving the road and I'll wave at somebody go oh I don't then I'll say well anyway true story out in Texas, true story. Out in Texas, a little country town. I'm driving down the road, and a fellow's driving up, and I recognized it was a church member. And so I just kind of swerved over at him just to kind of tease him a little bit. And you know what he did? He said, preacher, you're number one. But it was not that number one finger. It was that second finger. And I called him on the phone. I said, I, I, true story, if I'm lying, I'm dying. I said, called him by name. I said, so I'm number one, huh? He said, I don't understand. I said, well, I just drove by you in that red truck, and you threw your finger out and told me I was number one. He liked to wreck his truck. Sometimes your senses will fail you. But let me tell you something. The word of God will never fail you. Well, I'm as sure as I'm standing here. I've got a more sure word of prophecy. That's what Peter said when he said, hey, we've seen him with our eyes, the transfigured Christ. But hey, we have a more sure word. I'm already in heaven in Christ. So I hope I make it to heaven. I don't hope so. I know so. I stroke out of here tonight, good possibility that I'll die, you'll die before the Lord comes. If he does it, we'll all go up together. But if we leave before he comes, those of us that know Christ, we're going to make a straight shot to be with him. For he promised us in John 14 that where he is, there will be also. Hey, I'm heaven bound with the hammer down. We're in Christ. Now, here's the sad thing. Will you appropriate? Will you take advantage of? Will you claim your heavenly blessings? I know a lot of saved people that live. Let me rephrase. I know a lot of people who claim to be saved, who live like a pauper. Kenny Baldwin preached a message several years ago, one of the best messages I've ever heard in my life. He said, 
Live like you are, not like you were. Some of you live like a spiritual pauper. You've been given every spiritual blessing in Christ, and yet your life is a testimony to bankruptcy. Years ago, the Chicago newspaper, J. Vernon McGee writes, he read, quote, the flop houses and saloons of Chicago's Skid Row were searched today for one Stanley William McKenna Walker, 50, an Oxford graduate and heir to an 8 million pound English estate. living destitute and broke among the slum houses of Chicago was a man who was worth, I think the rest of the article said, half of eight million pounds. Years later, Dr. McGee re relayed that story. It's in one of his books I read this afternoon. Years later, he read, uh, he told that story, and he said a lady from Chicago walked up to him and said, Dr. McGee, did you hear the end of that story? He said, no, I didn't. And they said, they found William McKenna Walker. Dr. McGee said, oh, that's wonderful. She said, no. They found him a few months later dead in the hallway of one of the tenement houses. He had eight million pounds at his disposal, and he died a pauper. You, dear Christian friend, me, dear Christian friend, we have the resources of God at our fingertips. We have the blessings of God. And yet because of sin, we refuse to live as a child of God and we live as a pauper of this world. Sin keeps you from experiencing the blessings of God. Oh, but I'm having a good time. You have no idea what you're missing. You are an heir to the kingdom of Christ, and you'd rather live in the devil's pig pen. He was an heir to the fortune, but died broken and penniless. My great fear after these years of pastoring and preaching, my great fear is that so many of our church family will die never availing themselves of the riches of Christ. We're blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, Christ Jesus. But number two, according as he hath chosen us, not only have we been blessed, but number two, we have been chosen. Now, don't let that throw you. He chose you. I read this quote yesterday from Adrian Rogers, a preacher now in heaven. Dr. Rogers writes, Did you know that God chose you before he laid the foundations of the earth? You talk about old-time religion. Well, friend, you can't get much more older than that. Well, before there were any trees, mountains, birds, and bees, God chose you to be one of his children. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, quoting a continued from Dr. Rogers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, God certainly must have chosen me before I came into this world because he never would have chosen me afterward. That means that you and I cannot take credit for our salvation. 1 John 4 verse 19 says, We love him because he first loved us. Harry Ironside said a little boy was asked, have you found the Lord? And the little boy said, I didn't know. He was lost. How wonderful God chooses us so that we could choose him. Though election is a divine mystery, it can bring great assurance to a believer's heart. Allow God's word to teach you further what it means to be chosen by him. Dr. Adrian Rogers Bellevue Baptist Church, Memphis, Tennessee. For the foundation of the world was laid, God had already chosen you to be a child. Now, you say, preacher, 
explain that. Glad you asked. Looking forward to it. The responsibility of choosing is God's. Therefore, the responsibility of the chosen is God's. Oh, I hope I can hang on. I hope I'm good enough. I hope I can hold on a little longer. Not necessary. He chose you, therefore you don't hold him. He holds you. The Bible says we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. The Bible says who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. You say, preacher, I've got to earn it. I've got to merit it. I've got to do something to please God. You must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, for it is he that holds you, not you that hold him. Matthew 20, many are called, few chosen. So, preacher, what, what do you mean by that? Well, it means that the call goes out on the restless way. Would you be saved? But few respond, I'll be saved. You say, well, preacher, what's my part? Well, Philip was asked by the deacon boy, say, how do you know you're saved? He said, well, I did my part, and God did his part. And the deacon boy, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. What did you do in order to be saved? Well, he said, I did all the sinning. And Jesus did all the saving. Amen. G. Campbell Moore commenting on John 15, 16 says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. He went on to say, That puts the responsibility on him. If he did the choosing, then he is responsible. See, we run away from this election. We run away from this choosing. But here's what you need to embrace. God loved you so much that he died for you and that he keeps you and that he'll present you faultless before the throne and all the pressure of your salvation is taken off of anything you might do, anything you might hope to do, and it is all to put over on Christ. And let me explain something to you. Christ is enough. Number two, the reason for our choosing He's chosen us, why? That we should be holy, without blame, before him in love. Towards God, we should be holy. We should be holy. We should be set apart towards him. The Bible says, Romans chapter 6, verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? There is some kind of crazy, mixed up, messed up theology that says, I've gotten saved, therefore I can live as I want. And the answer to that is, no, you cannot. You're demanded, you're called to be holy, for he is holy. Grace is not a license to sin. Grace never lowers the bar. Grace elevates the bar. We are chosen to be holy. He wants us to be a peculiar, separated people unto himself. That we should be holy towards God. That we should be without blame from the world. I'm afraid that the world has good reason to blame a lot of the Christians they know. It's called hypocrisy, inconsistency. Well, if that's religion, I don't need that. First John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know uh, that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a, what's the next word? You want to be a liar? You want to be a liar? How many lives does it take to be a liar? Just one. You know what we are? God help us. 
Liar, liar, pants on fire. Why? I love God, but I'm going to live like the world. I'm going to love God, but I'm going to wallow in the filth and the muck and the mire. But I'm going to come to church. You're a liar. I, by the way, I didn't say that. God said that. You can't say how much you love the Lord while you're living like the world. Now, we're in the world, but we are not to be stained by the world. And let me help you. I understand. I know some of you think Christians, uh, I love you to death, but you think preachers live in some glass vacuum. I live across the street. Same mess that you're tempted with, same pull that you have, same, same trouble and struggles and trust. And by the way, my background doesn't make it any easier, but it makes it that much more difficult because some of the sinful decisions I made in my past. Hey, there is a constant pull on this flesh to go back into the world, to go back into sin, to go back into the lifestyle that we came out of. But hey, listen, there is a greater pull. There is the pull of Jesus Christ. There is the pull of holiness. There is the pull to be unspotted by the world because the bridegroom is coming and he's looking for a spotless bride 13 years now just an illustration he's leaving so it doesn't hurt brother, brother Mark I'm so proud of you been married 13 years you have only cheated on Andrew, uh, Andrea once a year for 13 years. Let's give him a hand. That's what's bad. <laughs> well, it's just once a year. The other 364 days, I'm, I'm clean as a hound suit. But that one day a year, you know, I just got to step out. We would be on her side while she leaves you, takes what you don't have, and goes on down the road. illustration let's let's make it better let's make Mark look better in 13 years he's only cheated on her one time you'd say oh no pastor no one's too many pastor and one is too many and he never has because she's from Kentucky and will kill him you and my wife shop at the same gun store I know then why, if that would be awful to say just once, it's just a little thing, why is it that week after week, year after year, we can continue in sin? God forbid that. Come out from among them and be ye saved. The world is looking for real. And by the way, real means they understand you struggle and you fall, but you're open, you're honest, you're transparent. You say, hey, I haven't arrived, but I'm really enjoying the journey. Christian struggle. This idea that, that the more spiritual you get, some higher plane. No, you always have feet of clay. The call to be holy, the call to be apart from this world without blame, and the call to love. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with bread, love, and honor, preferring one another. The truth is, Verse 4, in love, really applies to verse 5. So we'll jump into that next week. But in love means, hey, I'm doing what I do, not for glory, not for self, but for the love of Christ, for it constrains me, and for the love of the lost, for it is my duty to present the gospel to them, and for the love of the brethren, which I'm to edify and build up along the way. We're called to be holy, to be without blame, to love. Now, let me go back to the theological problem. We have been chosen, but we still have a choice. We have been chosen, but we still have a choice. Jesus said unto him, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. I am the door by me if any man enter in 
he shall be saved. Shall go in and out and find pasture. If any man. But Jesus is the door. If any man. D.L. Moody said, two groups of people, the whosoever wills are the elect. And the whosoever wants are the non-elect. If you're elect, not non-elect. God votes for you. The devil votes against you. And you cast a deciding vote. God chooses you. But you must turn and accept him. Second, Tim, Second Thessalonians 2 verse 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord. Because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of glory by our, our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 2. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, according or through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. Listen, you cannot take this choosing out of the Bible, but you cannot take your choice out of the choosing. I, I read, I didn't read, several years ago, I had a guy make a statement. He said, if you can ever use a Bible illustration to prove a Bible point, it is the best illustration. So I want to use a Bible illustration for you. Make two or three closing points. We'll be done. How many of you remember Acts 27, Paul and the great shipwreck? Okay. They're, they're on their way, and the storm comes, the seasoned sailors are fearing for their life and, and they, are, they are going to kill the prisoners, abandon ship, and just throw themselves into the mercy of the waves. And, and Paul stands up and he says to the captain, to the centurion there, he says, Sirs, be of good cheer. That's great. I mean, we're, we're going to Titanic. We're, don't worry about it. Be happy, happy, happy. He, said, he says, and, and I'm just giving you the story so it's not verbatim, so you can look it up, Acts 27. Sirs, be of good cheers. Tonight, an angel of the Lord has stood by me and said, we're all going to be safe. Right? Am I, am I telling it pretty, pretty good right there? It, we're all going to make it. Don't worry. Now, he says, okay, lighten the load, but don't kill the prisoners, and let's keep driving into the wind. A little bit later... When the storm gets worse and the ship really starts to break up, what do some of the sailors do? You're doing this. What are you, what are you doing? They start to jump. They begin to let the ship, the, the lifeboats down, remember? And Paul goes back and he says, except ye abide in the ship. So what does the centurion do? He cuts off the lifeboats and let her drive. Now, at any point did God change his mind? You stay with the boat, you'll be saved. But they had a choice to do their own thing. I didn't write this down, but it just came in my mind. I'm going to use it. <clears throat> in the doctrine of election or choosing, remember what I said this morning, the law of prime mention very important for all Bible study. Who was the first false religionist in the Bible? Cain. He brought an offering of the ground, right? And he offered it, God rejected it, and there, there is a discourse between God and Cain. And Cain is rejected by God for his offering, and he's going to be judged by God. But what does God, you know what, we better look that up because I think you ought to see that. Go to Genesis chapter number uh, 4. 
Why are, look at verse 6. Why art thou wroth? And why is thy countenance fallen? Verse 7. If thou doest well, shalt, now look at it. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be, what's the next word? Now what is Cain right now in verse 6? He's rejected. But he says, if thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Now literally, what, 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 what God is saying is, Cain, you've not done what I ask, but there at the door is what? Now, was there sin? That's always interesting. There's some sin. Clean it up. No. When you took a sacrifice and you, uh, you, you, you would have to, you'd have to literally put your hands, I'm not going to test you have to put your hands over on the sacrifice before you would go and offer it. And symbolically, what you're saying is this sin is represented, this, this, this animal, not this sin, this animal is representative of my sin, therefore it will be slain, the blood procedure, all that. So the sin offering, what he was talking about there, there was a lamb close by. Yes. And he was saying, Cain, change your mind. There, there's an offering. There is a represent. There's what I've asked you to give me, not fruit. I'm glad you like your fruit. But there's a sin offering. If there's election, Cain had no choice. But he didn't have a choice. And he rejected obedience to God. God chooses, but we have a choice. Now, let me give you those last couple of points, and we'll be finished. Somewhere in God's foreknowledge, He knows everything. He knows those who will accept Him and who will not. Somewhere is our choice. Somewhere these two come together. Now, there's a giant cloud from our point of view. And we can't see that. Illustrate, again, go back to J. Vernon McGee. By the way, don't you love the simple preachers of the Bible? The old Bible bus is still one of the best trips you can take. J. Vernon McGee said, imagine as you, a human, look at heaven. Over the door of heaven hangs a sign that reads, Whosoever will may enter. I am the door by me. If any man shall enter, he shall be saved. So on this side, whosoever will may enter. Jesus said, I am the door. So we say, I accept the Lord by faith. We enter the door. Now as soon as we get into heaven, we turn around, and on the other side of the door has these words, chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. Now here's the, here's the great truth that I'll leave you with. God chose me in eternity past because in his foreknowledge I would choose him in eternity future. Therefore, I am in Christ and he is in me. He has called me to be holy. He has called me to be without blame. And he's called me to love him and love others. Preacher, I just can't understand that. You're not supposed to. From heaven's point of view, he knows. Someone said to Spurgeon, by the way, Spurgeon, everybody knows Spurgeon was a strong Calvinist. But someone said to Spurgeon, I don't like the way you preach. Because you preach election, but you give public invitations for all men to repent and be saved. And Spurgeon said, if God, would have made all the elect, or painted is the word he used. If God would have painted all the elect with yellow stripes, I would go all over the world looking at the backs of men to see who had the yellow stripe is not. But since he did not, I preach a whosoever will gospel so that whosoever will may come. We don't know, but God does. 
and instead of being a fearful thing that you run away from, you ought to embrace that and say, I serve Creator God who knows all things. And if you're lost, He's not one that any should perish. By the way, don't confuse the verses you don't know with the ones you do know. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that just a few, that just a part, that just didn't know, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. I'm a whosoever, you're a whosoever, without doing any disservice to the Scripture. You can change that verse. For God so loved Brent Stansel. For God so loved Chad Whitaker. For God so loved Paul and Drexel Betts. For God so loved Al Pugh. That if Al Pugh or Nancy Luttrell or Noah Hart would believe, then Chad or Rich or Rick or whoever should have everlasting life. I'm chosen, but I have a choice. And as I make that choice in Him, I'm called to be holy. I'm called to be blameless. And I'm called to love. Some of you, I'm done. But some of you, you get stuck on that election. How about this? I know I'm saved. And if you know Christ, you're saved. We ought to work on that holiness, blamelessness, and love. Father, I pray you bless now. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for the rightly dividing of the Word of God. And Lord Jesus, I pray you give us tremendous wisdom to share Christ, to be a witness of the gospel. Lord, here, Pinellas, state of Florida, United States, around the world. Calls us, Lord, to love the God who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Rebecca's come. Let me ask you a question, Christian. Christian first. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Holy, blameless, love. Holy, blameless, love. You say you're saved, all right. Are we lying because we, we're not loving Him like we should? We're not being filled with His Spirit by filling on the things of God? That's your question that you can answer. I hope you do tonight. Second question, there may be someone here that's lost on their way to a devil's eternal hell. God knows my heart. I I've read the Bible enough and I've been convinced and convicted enough. I don't want you to go there. Jesus doesn't want you to go there. Truth is, you don't want to go there. You don't have to go there. My daddy said years ago, everybody can be saved. Everybody needs to be saved. Everybody gets saved the same way. Why don't you call on Jesus tonight? You're a sinner, you know it. There's no question about it. You've fallen short of God's perfect mark. By faith, you'll believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried, rose again. You'll ask Him to forgive you of your sin. You'll ask Him to give you that new life in Christ. If you're here tonight and you don't know that you're saved, I'll be at the front. There'll be others available. I want to take a Bible and show you from the Word of God what it means to be a Christian. Christian, you're going to come and you're going to talk to the Lord about where you stand. You've been chosen. How's your holiness, blamelessness, love? Let's stand to our feet. Heads are my eyes are closed. Rebecca plays. You're stepping out. You're coming. You need to be saved. Going to die. Don't want you to, but going to die. Do you know Christ? Only trust Him. Come every soul.
by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in You know that chorus, we'll sing it together now, here we go. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you, He will save you, He will save you now. You need to make other decisions. Maybe you're going to join the church. Had a precious lady came up this morning, said, I've been coming for a month. She said, I'm joining next Sunday. I love it here. She said, by the way, I brought my sister, my brother-in-law, and their five kids. They need to come too. They need to join a good fundamental Bible-believing church that just wants to please the Lord. Maybe you need to make some other decisions. I don't know what it is, but the altar's open. We'll sing the second verse, and we'll join in on that big chorus together. If you're lost, come be saved. If you're saved, come do business with the Lord. You step out of your place. You come. For Jesus shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. Plunge now into the crimson flood that washes Here we go now. as snow. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Sing that chorus again now. Only trust him. Only trust him. Only trust him now. He will save you. He will save you. He will save you now. Amen. Amen. Next week, verse 5. Predestination. We got chosen. We'll get predestination next week. Amen. Listen, we're going to receive two offerings. And we're going to receive our first and regular offering. And, and by the way, again, I mentioned this morning, uh, it is a difficult season. We're coming out of the holidays and kind of getting back on our feet. And uh, we need you to be faithful in your giving. And, and the Lord will bless. We're, we're never worried. Uh, the Lord has never failed us all these years. He has scared us to death a time or two, but never failed us. But uh, be faithful, please, in your regular giving, in your missions giving. That check is cut every month, and it goes out to our missionaries. Uh, our bills come, and we pay them. And we, we're, we're blessed but be faithful in your giving. And then uh, after our first offering, uh, we're going to ask the men to reset. And uh, we, we really, now listen, listen to your preacher. Mark lost two weeks of meetings because of the snow. Now it's Mark's fault for being in Michigan. Smart people left years ago. But, but, that's where his family is, and, and I understand that. However, uh, they did lose two weeks. I mean, for an evangelist, for a missions evangelist family, uh, that's two weeks of income. They, they don't get, oh, you didn't come to our church, so we'll just send you the check. So on the second offering, be gracious in your giving. Let's make up for them uh, losing. Plus, they got in a... Uh, would you tell just that day you tried to leave stories somewhere before? I'll, I'll ask Mark and, and them to come back and sing for us uh, in just a moment. And also just make an, uh, an introduction to the table and what we have. But we'll receive the first offering and then Mark and them will come back and we'll receive a second offering as well. Father, bless the gift, the giver. May we use it wisely now for the furtherance of the gospel here and around the world. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. God bless you as you give.
Amen. Brother Paul is going to come and we'll make a few announcements. Uh, don't forget, next Sunday night after church, we'll have our Teen Cafe Super Bowl party. We'll record the game so that we can watch it in its entirety. And uh, we normally fast forward so that we get to about the third quarter and watch the end of it together. Uh, but we'll see it all without all the other stuff. And there'll be food and fellowship. It'll be a lot of fun. And that's a fundraiser for the kids. So $20 covers your whole family, or if you're four or less, it's $5 per ticket. There is a Master Club regional practice on Saturday uh, the 25th. Uh, let's see. It's been moved to so Saturday the 25th to February the 1st. So it's from the 25th to the 1st and uh, from 10 to 1. Uh, also, teen outreach next Saturday at 1 o'clock. Uh, excuse me. Next Saturday at 1030, bring some money for Taco Bells. Pick up the kids at 1 uh, next Sunday is Super Bowl, then the next Sunday is Archie Watkins, then the next Sunday is the Rochesters. And so we have a great month of music. Also, we have our family conference coming up, and please, please register for that, and uh, you'll want to be a part of that. And then also we're trying to carpool and or on Thursday evening take a bus down to the Bill Bailey Sing. And uh, Thursday night is a night that a lot of us are going to go because that's Greater Vision the Booth Brothers, and Legacy 5. But others of you are going and uh, get with, get with the, the Welcome Center or the church office, and uh, you can carpool perhaps. But that's over in Palmetto uh, for the gospel singing. All right, who's next? All right, the results for the chili cook-off are in. But before we get to the results, I uh, want to go over one thing real fast. If you look around tonight, there's a lot of people in the building, and we have a lot of chili. But we ask that you do one thing. If you just sample the chili before you fill up a bowl and decide you don't like it and throw it away. Now, let me ask this question tonight. How many of you uh, knew Jeff Houston? Will you raise your hand? How many of you knew Jeff Houston? Okay, several of you. If you didn't know Jeff Houston, he was just a great guy. Uh, he joined the church, and he just decided he was going to do what he loved for the Lord. And he cooked, and he cooked, and he cooked, and he cooked. And uh, he was just a great blessing to have around. So tonight, we just remember him. In third place, always a contender, Miss Valerie Stansel. Now, we did something a little bit different this year. We combined all the categories. If you have any questions about that, just uh, feel free to ask them afterwards. Second place, Kaylin Richmond. She has left the building. She's in the nursery. I'll take her. No, I'm just kidding. And in first place, Chuck Joe Truitt. Will you please stand? Chuck Joe Truitt. Great job, everybody. Thank you so much for everybody who participated. And we look forward to going over for Chili right after the service. Okay, good. Good. Any other announcements? Any other announcements? All right, listen, if, uh, if you would stay, uh, if you don't stay, I know where you live, okay? And uh, we'll have a great time. Brother Tyler, missionary, where you at, Brother Allen? You know what? Let's do it next week. Let's do it next week. It's 15 till. Your mind can only absorb what your bottom can stand. All right? Let's all stand together, and uh, we'll be dismissed. I love you. God bless you. You're dismissed.